Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first session on the second day of ZJLF at British Library Piazza. This session is called Footloose, the travel session. And in this session, we have Hugh Thompson, Monisha Rajesh, Anthony Satin, Samanthan Subramanian in, converse, in conversation with William Dalrymple. May I please request you to keep your phones on switched off or silent mode? Welcome uh, for the second day. Um, this is a session we have every year at Jaipur, the travel session. Uh, and uh, it breaks from the usual format of, of panel discussions or lectures in that it's uh, the old fashioned uh, format of readings. Um, and I invite always four or five travel writers uh, to uh, read a passage from their work, and then we'll uh, broach out into discussion uh, and uh, audience questions. Travel writing is one of the most ancient forms of writing in the world, and also one of the most universal. The novel was only invented in the 18th century, but travel writing, like epic poetry, goes back to the very roots of man's earliest literary endeavors. Whether we're talking about the wanderings of uh, 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 the, the uh, uh, Chaldeans and uh, Gilgamesh uh, and uh, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh reconstructed from clay tablets uh, found in the basements of the palaces of Ur uh, and the Sumerian capitals, whether we're talking about the wanderings of the patriarchs of the Old Testament or the wanderings of the Pandava brothers uh, in the Mahabharat. Tales of people taking to the road uh, in search of things, looking for things, on quests, are forms of literature that appear in almost every culture in the world, uh, as well, obviously, as, as, as a long history of European travel writing. There are the great Arab travelers, Chinese travelers. Japanese travelers, Indian travelers, uh, and uh, uh, whether fictionalized uh, or uh, uh, um, straightforwardly factual accounts uh, of journeys, this is something that has appeared in almost every continent at different times. The earliest travel writings are usually, um, the, the earliest factual travel writings are usually um, accounts of either pilgrimages or accounts of merchants. Think of Marco Polo uh, on his journey to China. A surprisingly uh, dry account in, in, in most cases. Uh, he records what you can buy in what bazaars. Uh, and it was only at a later period of the manuscript when he, Marco Polo ended up in a G Genoese prison with a romance writer called Rosticello uh, that you get tales about griffins and extraordinary stories about people with one leg and, uh, and pygmies with two heads and this sort of thing gets added to the mix. The great tra Arab travel writers, Ibn Jubayr, Ibn Battuta, uh, Lipo uh, in the West, Hu and Sang uh, coming to look at the, uh, the pilgrimage sites of India. Uh, then you have a, a rather different thing going on during the colonial period when you often have uh, travel writers marching uh, uh, along with the drumbeat of imperialism, whether it's figures like Alexander Burns traveling into Central Asia while actually acting as an East, East, East India Company spy, um, nonetheless <coughs> winning the Royal Medal of the jo Royal Geographical Society and the French Geographical Society. And then you get a whole new phase again in the 1920s, at a period when people um, took the view that the, the world had already been written, that there were very, very few new journeys to be made uh, into unknown mountain ranges or uh, into previously untraveled jungles. And then you get this extraordinary rebirth of travel writing as, uh, as a comic form, as a literary form, with writers like Robert Byron, Peter Fleming, Evelyn Waugh. Uh, and then again, post-colonially, uh, a new wave of writers, writers like Vikram Seth going off to Heaven's Lake, Amitav Ghosh in an, an, in an antique land, uh, and so on. So it's a, it's a literature which has very, very deep roots, but which has always shown an extraordinary capacity for reinventing itself. And I think uh, if you think of the latest crop of, uh, of young writers from Manisha or Samant or, or Hugh or Anthony through to um, people like Robert McFarlane, 
Um, you see that, you see the, the, again, the, the, the genre reinventing itself for a period when you can go onto a laptop anywhere in the world and look up Google Maps. And, and in a sense, the need, for, uh, the need for travel writing, sorry, travel writing answers quite different needs. Uh, it's a more literary thing. Uh, it's a less descriptive thing. Uh, often, it's a journey uh, into the people that you encounter. There's a wonderful Jonathan um, uh, Rayburn quote, uh, which goes something like this. Old travelers grumpily complain uh, that there are no journeys to be made anymore, uh, that, uh, uh, that the world has become a suburb. How wrong they are, he says. Uh, they allow the external similarity of things to... Uh, mask, to mask the utter difference that still exists in the world. And that is true. You can go to Jaipur uh, and uh, see the same chain stores, the McDonald's and the Nike shops that you can find in this city or New York or uh, Shanghai or uh, Tokyo. And yet in Jaipur, you know, a woman who went to a secondary school as recently as 20 years ago chose to commit sati. Uh, what are the social pressures? That, uh, uh, that, uh, what are the uh, structures? What are the hierarchies? That, uh, uh, that can allow that to happen. Uh, these are the sort of things that travel writers today are ex uh, exploring and trying to explain. <coughs> so we have a very diverse panel uh, from different parts of the world, uh, all writers I hugely admire, and we're just going to go around in a semicircle, um, each of us reading from our work, and uh, uh, we'll then branch out into a discussion. Um, one quick thing to point out um, that you'll find on your programs that uh, Christina Lamb, uh, was due to be here. Uh, one of the problems with uh, trying to get a travel panel is that travellers travel. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, Christina turns out to be in Iran today, uh, so unable to join us. But we have instead Manisha, who I didn't initially invite uh, on this panel, only because she was nine months pregnant. And uh, uh, she, is, she has emerged only eight days ago from the birthing suite, and her baby's outside. So if you hear... <laughs> <laughs> If you hear some loud crying uh, and, and see her dart out, that's what's happened. She hasn't uh, taken huge offence to what someone has read out. Not what? yet. Yeah. Not yet. Um, I'm going to read from my first book, Around India in 80 Trains, um, which came out a few years ago, but I'm currently working on Around the World in 80 Trains, which thankfully I did about a year ago before <laughs> the baby turned up, because I can't really do that kind of travel again. Um, but uh, let me start reading from a chapter about riding on uh, Mumbai's commuter trains, which is it's something that so the BBC has this obsession with Indian railways, and it's always you know always about the the commuter trains and these vicious locals. So it was something that we had to do when we when we went there. Mumbai was like a thousand cities poured into one. Stepping onto the platform felt immediately different. You could sense it on your skin and taste it in the air. This was India in its most concentrated form. Delhi was teeming and vast, but its pockets of green offered space to breathe and time to stroll. Mumbai raged unharnessed. If you strolled, you'd be trampled, or at least knocked over by a cyclist. Even the tendency towards idling was noticeably absent. In Mumbai, everyone meant business, and the feeling was addictive. This was our second visit to Mumbai, and as the tide of commuters swept its way through the halls of CST, dragging us with it, a familiar thrill heated up my blood, or perhaps it was just an early symptom of malaria. <laughs> Mumbai was a city of dreams and a city of nightmares, of hopes and of horrors, and I hoped to find the latter on the spaghetti trails of its commuter trains. After a month of smooth rides and few delays, it was time for a journey that would spice things up a little. So far, everyone we'd met had issued the same warning. Do not, in any circumstance, attempt to ride the local train. It's not for novices which we interpreted as an open invitation to do just that. Mumbai's train network, or the locals, is notorious for passengers compressed in the open doorways, grazing the roof with their fingertips, inches from certain death. During rush hour, a nine-car rate designed for 1,800 standing passengers often carries up to 7,000, known as a super-dense crush load. It was a suicidal exercise in survival that seven million of Mumbai's workers were forced to endure on a daily basis, almost the population of Greater London. The vulnerable nature of their close proximity had made commuters the perfect target for terrorists who attacked in 2006, hiding explosives in pressure cookers that killed at least 180 people and injured more than 800 in a series of coordinated blasts at rush hour. Mumbai's local trains were certainly not for the faint-hearted. 
As the train drew in, the crowd tensed in anticipation, like a row of runners waiting for a starter pistol. When the noise of the engine reached the platform and the sound of braking and creaking grew deafening, moustaches and sweat-sodden polyester shirts appeared in the doorways, looming larger and higher before they suddenly leapt into the air from the carriages and hit the ground running. Before the train had stopped, hordes of men rained down on us with monsoon force, while the rows behind began to heave forward, reaching over our heads to grab the doorways and haul themselves in. The papaya I was holding was knocked from my hand and slipped down my leg. Once again, the rule was simple, attack or be attacked. Crushed between satchels, stale armpits and wet skin, spitting out mouthfuls of coconut oil flavored hair, we managed to push forward and fell into the middle of the carriage. Bent double and wheezing, I saw that beyond the human barrier at the doorways, the carriage had spare seats. The crush was just another one of India's little mysteries. Sitting down, I wiped the papaya from my knee where a fly was rubbing his legs with glee and looked around at fellow passengers. Their angst was always short-lived. Moments earlier, they'd shoved, kicked, and elbowed each other in the face. Now they sat shoulder to shoulder, snoozing, stabbing at phones, or staring at me. I stared back. Most became bored and looked away. One brought out his phone and took a photo. It was fair enough. If we could waltz around photographing their daily life, why shouldn't they? As we neared CST, the crowd had dwindled, and I was now standing in the doorway, both arms looped around the pole, invigorated by the blast of air. But something looked wrong. The train had come into the station and was already sailing by the platform when pockets of men appeared, inching their way towards the edge, crouched low, satchels over shoulders. Before the train had stopped, they took flying leaps into the doors, desperate to bag seats for the next train's journey. Those last seconds became a blur, but my companion was rugby tackled by a mouse of a man wearing bell bottoms. He threw himself through the doorway while I ducked my head and rolled onto the platform, hoping I wouldn't be stamped if I even survived the impact. Checking for blood and bruises, we brushed ourselves off, gripped hands through the crowds with an air of triumph. So that was rush hour. I'm going to read from an old book called City of Gins um, that um, I wrote in the um, early 90s. Uh, and very oddly now, in a sense, records a city that no longer exists. It's become a sort of historical document in itself. Uh, it records a Delhi, which in those days was about 4 million people. Today, if you count the, uh, the city seen from space, in other words, across uh, state boundaries, uh, and include Gurgaon, Faridabad, uh, Noida, and all the other excrescences that Delhi has, uh, and carbuncles that Delhi has produced off its body politic, uh, you find uh, uh, it's about 26 million and the second largest uh, urban area on earth after Greater Tokyo. Hmm. Uh, and uh, yet this is a city, uh, I, this book records a city of, uh, uh, that's was still in relatively sort of rural. You could drive uh, happily from uh, um, Suffragan's tomb to the Kutub Minar and uh, past these little urban villages, which were only then beginning to be properly encroached by Delhi proper, uh, a place where at night the roads were completely empty. You could drive uh, uh, at uh, 11 o'clock from uh, a defense colony to golf links and never pass another car. Uh, an extraordinary thought now, where you have traffic jams often at 2 in the morning. Um, the city I wanted to, the conundrum I wanted to work out about the city was um, why it was that Delhi, which had for so many centuries been regarded as the epitome of Mughal courtliness, uh, the center of the, of the, the home of the Urdu language. Ghalib said that uh, Urdu was a child found wandering in the bazaars of Shah Jahanabad. Um, a, a one that set the tone of manners, etiquette, and good behavior in courts across India. Today was this sort of rude, vibrant, shoving, sort of nouveau riche heiress, uh, covered in bling and sort of partying hard, full of Punjabi musti. Uh, and the answer, of course, really was partition. Uh, partition had emptied out the old elite, the remains of the Mughal court. Um, who had left or fled in uh, 47 for Karachi and who had been replaced by the refugees driven out of uh, Pakistan at its creation in the catastrophe 
uh, of partition 70 years ago. And I went off to Karachi to try and find the man who had, in my view, recorded, written the greatest novel uh, of Delhi, uh, which was uh, Twilight in Delhi, uh, written by Ahmed Ali, published by Virginia Woolf and E.M. Forster in the Hogarth Press just before the, uh, the Blitz. And the entire stock of the first edition was, was, was firebombed and destroyed. And only odd, very rare odd copies of that first edition survives. And yet that first edition uh, had an unprecedented um, uh, reception from the London literati. And in a sense, was the, was the first really celebrated Indian novel in English in this country uh, uh, that received rave reviews uh, and uh, opened the doors for post-colonial generations like Vyas Naipaul and, and Salman Rushdie and everyone else that followed. And yet, when you looked at the bookshelves, there was nothing from Ahmed Ali after the war. Um, and I discovered that he was living alone and embittered, um, uh, more or less unpublished, living in a, um, a small suburb of Karachi. Um, and I, with the help of his Delhi publisher, David Davida, uh, I managed to track him down and go and see him uh, and ask him about the Delhi of his childhood that he recorded in Twilight of Delhi. Ahmed Ali was there to meet us. He wore severe black trimmed glasses, above which sprouted a thin pair of grey eyebrows. He slurred his consonants and had the slightly limp wrist and a feet manner of one who modelled himself on a Bloomsbury original. For a man once seen as the champion of Delhi's culture, a bulwark of Eastern civilization against the seepage of Western influence, Ahmed Ali now cut an unexpectedly English figure. With his clipped accent and tweed jacket and old leather elbow patches, he could have passed off successfully as a clubland character from a Noel Coward play. But despite his comfortable, well-to-do appearance, Ahmed Ali was an angry man. Over the years I spent with him, he spluttered and spat like a well-warmed frying pan. The first occasion was when I inadvertently mentioned that he was now a citizen of Pakistan. Poppycock, balderdash, he said. I was always against Jinnah. Never had any influence and never had any interest in Pakistan. Steady on, said his friend, Shanul Haq. The devil, said Ali. Pakistan's not a country, never was. It's a damned hotchpotch. It's not your country or my country. He was shouting at Shanul Haq now. It's a country of a damn bunch of feudal lords, robbers, bloody murderers, kidnappers. The outburst spluttered out into silence. But, I ventured, didn't you opt for Pakistan? Surely you could have stayed in Delhi had you wanted to. There was another explosion. I opted for Pakistan, I did not. I was the visiting professor in Nanking when the blasted partition took place. The bloody swine of Hindus wouldn't let me go back home, so... What do you mean? I went and saw the Indian ambassador in Peking. Bloody, bloody swine said I couldn't return. Said it was a question of Hindu against <laughs> Muslim, and there was nothing he could do. I was caught in China and had nowhere to go. Careful, said Shamil Haq, seeing the state his friend had worked himself up into. So how did you end up in Karachi, I said. When my salary in Nanking was stopped, I found my way to some friends in Hong Kong. They put me on an amphibious boat to Karachi. Where else could I have gone if I couldn't go back to Delhi? Ali had ceased to quiver with rage and was now merely very cross. I never opted for Pakistan, he said, gradually regaining his poise. The civilization I belonged to, the civilization of Delhi, came into being through the mingling of two different cultures, Hindu and Muslim. That civilization flourished for 1,000 years, undisturbed, <coughs> until certain people came along and denied that that great mingling had taken place. Views like that can hardly have made you very popular here, I said. They've never accepted me in Pakistan, damn it. I've been weeded out, he said. They don't publish my books, they've deleted my name. When copies of Twilight in Delhi arrived at the Karachi customs from India, they sent them back, said the book was about the forbidden city from across the border. <coughs> they implied that the culture was foreign and subversive. <laughs> In that case, I said, couldn't you go back to Delhi? Couldn't you reapply for Indian citizenship? Now no country is my country, said Ali. 
Delhi is dead. The city that was, the language, the culture, everything I knew and loved is finished. It's true, said Shahnul Haq. I went back 13 years after partition. Already everything was different. I stayed in a new hotel, the Ambassador, which I only later realized had been built on top of a graveyard where several of my friends were buried. In my mahalla, everyone used to know me, but suddenly I was a stranger. My haveli was split in ten parts and occupied by Punjabis. My wife's house had become a temple. Delhi was no longer the abode of the Delhi Walla. Even the walls had changed. It was very depressing. Before partition, said Ali, Delhi was a unique city. Although it was already very poor, still it preserved its high culture. That high culture filtered down to the streets. Everyone was part of it. Even the milkmen could quote Mir and Dag. They would, the prostitutes would sing Persian songs and recite Hafiz. They may not have been able to read and write, but they could remember the poets. And the language, said Shanul Haq. You cannot conceive how chaste Delhi Urdu was. And how rich, said Ali. Every mahalla had its own expressions. The language used by our ladies was quite distinct from that used by the men. Now the language has shrunk. So many words are lost. We talked for an hour about the Delhi of their childhood and youth. We talked of the eunuchs, the hijras, the Sufis and the pigeons and the poets, of monsoon picnics in Merali and the jinn who fell in love with Ahmed Ali's aunt. We talked to the sweetmeat sellers that stayed open until three in the morning, the sorcerers who could cast spells over a whole mahalla, the possessed women who used to run vertically up the zanana walls, and the miraculous cures affected by Hakim Ajmal Khan. The old men swam together through great oceans of nostalgia before finally coming ashore on a strand of melancholy. But all of that is no more, said Ali. All that made Delhi special has been uprooted and dispersed. Now it is a carcass without a soul, said Shanul Haq. I am a fossil, said Ali, and Shanul Haq is on his way to becoming a fossil. <laughs> <laughs> But nevertheless, I insisted, if you both love Delhi so much, wouldn't you like to see it one more time? Hmm. I will never see that town again, said Ali, defiantly. Once I was invited to give some lectures in Australia. There was some mechanical fault, and the plane was diverted to Delhi. The plane landed, but I refused to get out. I said, I'm not getting out. I don't have to. You call your damn chairman. But I'm not putting my foot on that soil which was sacred to me and which has now been desecrated. They got the entire staff of the airport there to get me out, but I didn't move. How could I? How could I revisit that which once was mine and now was no longer mine? When they asked why I was behaving as I was, I simply sat in my seat and quoted Mir Taki Mir at them. What matters it, O oh breeze, if now has come the spring? when I have lost them both, the garden and my nest. What happened, I asked. The swine were all Punjabis, said Ali. Tell you the truth, I don't think they understood a bloody word I said. <laughs> Always a joy to follow with you. <laughs> Um, I'm glad the tent is heating up because uh, after a couple of couple of stories from Delhi, I have a story from Egypt for you. Um, so you know the climate is is, is appropriate, uh, and it's a story from from a book I wrote called The Pharaoh's Shadow. Um, and the, the the premise for this book is that that if you go to Egypt, you expect to walk around a building that, that's three or four thousand years old, but nobody had looked to see if the culture that that existed around those old buildings had survived in, in any way into, into modern Egypt. So that was what I was doing. And the story in particular I have for you uh, today is um, the story of a woman in Luxor, on the west bank of Luxor, who lived in a mud brick house in front of a, one of these big temples. The temple belonged to the pharaoh Ramses III. It's from 1000 BC. 
Um, and it's actually more intact than, her, than this woman's house. The woman's name is Habiba. Uh, Hamida, sorry. And she, she um, had this sort of uh, gynecological problem that she couldn't get pregnant. Um, and when she did finally get pregnant, she had a daughter, but she needed a son. And it was uh, becoming a problem for her marriage. So she went to the doctor, and then she went to the imam in the mosque, and then she went to the local holy woman, and nothing happened. She didn't, she didn't get pregnant. Um, and so the story went that finally she went to the temple, and she um, immersed herself in the sacred lake of the temple, and prayed to the ancient gods and became pregnant. Um, and bore a son. And uh, this was a mixed joy for her. She was obviously delighted that she had a son and her marriage would be saved. But um, she was very worried about the consequences of this. So she called her son Shahat, which in Arabic means beggar. Uh, she wanted to keep the evil eye off him. She was sure that this son would never make it to maturity. But he did. And I, I went and found this woman, and I found him. But I was looking for the, you know, what, was, what did she really do in the temple? What, what, what was that, uh, that interaction? And she wouldn't talk about it at first, but her son said, oh, we just told, because there, there was an anthropologist who wrote this story in the, in the 70s, an American. And it then became a very important story for anthropology, taught in universities and things. But the, this guy, Shahat, said, we just told, told this guy whatever we thought he wanted to hear. <laughs> so... Um, so I went to see a, a friend of mine who lived nearby um, who knew the story and knew the people. And, and so this is the story of him taking me to the, to the lake. And he thought we should wait until night, because that's when, uh, when Hamida went. We lay back on the mud brick benches, sipping beer, watching the light fade. After Cairo, the place was intoxicatingly calm, and I caught the slightest sounds, children crying in a house a long way off, a dog barking on the hill, the neighbors bringing their animals in for the night and getting their food ready. As night fell, a thick silence wrapped itself around the house. And then other sounds came with the darkness. A breeze rustled palms on the edge of the field, and the eucalyptus which had grown out of the courtyard and now towered over the house. Mohammed, one of the neighbors, was sitting out talking softly to one of his brothers. An animal screeched up in the hills, and I sat up to look. The great limestone crags were glowing in the night as if the pharaohs and queens buried in their hillside tombs still had the power to command life and light. The glow was reflected moonlight. When Zaytun saw it, he decided it was time to visit the temple. First, he went looking for his stick, in case we meet a snake or something. Black dogs outside the neighbors' houses showed their teeth and snarled. I shushed them. Zaytun waved his stick. We cut across the fields along the ridge of an irrigation channel and climbed over the mound of earth that had covered the temple's ancient outer wall. From the top, I could see the whole complex, the fortress-like main temple, its walls slanting inwards as they rose to exaggerate the sense of their mass and solidity. To the right, the slender trunk of a single palm supported an extravagance of fronds. All around lay the architectural salvage of ages past, stone lintels and basins, <coughs> pools and wellheads. And around the perimeter wall, for much of its course, there were still remains of the Medina, the town of Jemme, which the Christian Copts built over Ramses's sacred compound after the old rites had been abandoned. Zaytun pointed out the lie of the land with his stick, how the fields behind us were slightly sunken, the remaining trace of a huge artificial lake connected by a canal to the Nile, along which the pharaohs sailed into his temple in the wet season. As in Ramses III's time, there were guards at the entrance to the temple. Zaytun didn't wait for them to find us or to be roused by the wild dogs which we were sure were prowling nearby. Instead, we went into their hut. After the handshakes, the slapping of backs, we had tea and a smoke. And then Zaytun announced that we were going to have a quick look at the temple. But Mudir, boss, said one of the guards, who didn't share a history with him. The temple is closed. It's forbidden. Never mind, Zaytun replied. The professor and I will not disturb anyone. And he handed out another round of cigarettes to smooth further objections. Medinet Habu was built as a power base during Ramses III's lifetime and as the center of his cult, where prayers to his memory were to be said after his death. 
Like his predecessors, Ramses III did not want to be buried near his temple. The place was too obvious. And like his people, he believed that his corpse and his many funerary objects had to be kept intact to ensure a happy afterlife. So, more than 1,500 years after the height of the Pyramid Age, Ramses had himself buried in secrecy alongside the other dead pharaohs in the Valley of the Kings. The temple, a couple of miles south, stood in for the grave as the place where Ramses, now deified, could be worshipped. Nothing I have seen in the world compares to Medinet Habu by moonlight for pure wonder and spookiness. Beneath the bright sky, the temple looks squat, as permanent as anything made by man can be, its limestone walls washed with silver. We walked away from the gatehouse, a two-story Syrian-inspired structure, which Ramses commissioned to commemorate a Middle East victory, which must have been fictitious, for by the time of his reign, Syria was no longer worth fighting. Across the outer courtyard, we passed between two smaller chapels and approached the main building. The massive gate was shut, so we walked around the outside, clockwise, coming first to the remains of the palace. The sand and scrub were littered with stone fragments. Like desert and delta, and pharaoh and fella, destruction and survival go hand in hand. We walked over the destroyed palace area, the basic, basic floor plan of the rooms had been recreated, and Zaytun tried to give me an idea of what the place might have looked like. It seemed small to me. We peered into the inner temple through the window of royal audience, where Ramses stood if he was watching a ceremony rather than taking part. Then we studied the inscriptions and images that cover the outer walls, the calendar of sacrifices that were to be made here, in the period of, an, of the anniversary of the pharaoh's accession, the exaggerated accounts of Ramses' military achievements, great images of the pharaoh hunting wild goats, asses, and bulls. Zaytun had seen it all many times before, but he was an architect, and he was still impressed. Look at the way they cut the stone. He ran a hand over the join between, between two of the great blocks. How did they know to cut their blocks so accurately? Look how they fit together, and see how the moonlight comes from the side and brings the pictures to life. We moved away towards the southeast corner of the compound. The main temple had reflected enough moonlight off its creamy walls to light up the ground around it, but the moon had sunk, and in the far corner it was dark. Zaytun began to brandish his stick, and I trod carefully, imagining snakes and scorpions and some of the beasts which, which terrorized the knights of the ancients. The sacred lake is somewhere near here, he warned, so be careful. You don't want to fall in. As my eyes adjusted, I saw several things rising out of the, back, the black ground, one of which looked like the entrance to an air raid shelter. Zaytun thought it was the nylometer. Inside, a flight of steps led down to water. The air was dank. I threw in a stone to see how deep it was and heard something, some things, scuttle around. Just some snakes, Zaytun said offhand, or maybe scorpions or bats or... In the half-light, I saw his broad smile. The sacred lake stood near the stone wall which separated the temple compound from the village of Komlola, where Shahat and his mother lived. We stood and listened to the sounds of life, of someone praying, a rustling nearby, someone moving away from us, a man calling out, one of the guards accosting someone. A few feet below us, the black, fetid water of the sacred lake bubbled like soup. My thoughts fractured and divided went back thousands of years to midnight rituals performed for the gods, back a few decades to Shahat's mother petitioning the gods here, in this place, to give her a healthy son, and then back to Zaytun and me standing at the water's edge. I was beyond pretending. I, I was scared. I think, I whispered into the darkness towards Zaytun, I think we should get out of here. I waited another moment. Zaytun, I whispered more loudly, let's go. There was no reply. He had already gone. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read from an essay that was published in Granta, in the India volume of Granta a couple of years ago. Uh, it's not strictly a travel essay, but it builds into my larger thesis of how you can incorporate travel writing into almost any form of writing that you do. So this was about a, this was a sort of story that I did out of a club in South Bombay called the Breach Candy Club. 
uh, one of its members had told me about all these sort of uh, internecine struggles and tussles between members of the club, which just seemed to me to symbolize, you know, it incorporated aspects of land and politics and uh, generational conflict and so on, all of which seemed to me to symbolize a lot of what is happening in India and in Indian cities in particular right now. Uh, so I'm just going to read from the beginning uh, where I sort of go into the club for the first time and just see what, what the club is even like. If you climb onto the diving platform of the pool at the Breach Candy Club, and if you turn your back to the ocean expiring on the rocks a few yards away, you look up into Mumbai. Or perhaps Mumbai looks down upon you. From its skyscraping fastnesses, the buildings rising higher and higher, pressing down upon the low, easy profile of the club, crowding it into the sea. To the left is the egg-white hulk of the Breach Candy Hospital. To the right, an apartment complex of similar height, painted a cheerful blue. In the distance hovers Antilia, the 27th floor billion dollar home of India's richest man. Much closer, right across the road from the club in fact, is the stillborn residence of a slightly poorer tycoon, a textile baron. For years now, it has been shrouded in green netting because rumor has it, Antilia's owner was so affronted by the thought of another luxury mansion sharing the skyline that he stalled the permits it required. <laughs> At night, when the rest of the buildings burn bright with light, the textile baron's house stands dark and cold, like a big rotten tooth. Three, there further away are the imperial towers, twin condominiums, 60 floors high, the tallest buildings in India. On a Diwali night, a friend told me, he had attended a party on the 20th floor of one imperial tower or the other, and from the balcony amid the fireworks, the city looked like Fallujah during the Iraq war. <laughs> Not that he had been to Fallujah during the Iraq war, <laughs> but somehow Mumbai seems to prod you into reaching for only the most fevered comparisons. <laughs> Yet another skyscraper is under construction, a crane perched atop its shell, and curiously nearer to earth are a gabled roof and a pointed clay-colored turret, a turret that belonged to Windsor Villa, where Salman Rushdie lived as a boy during the 1950s, and from where, as he wrote in Midnight's Children, he could spot pink people cavorting in the map-shaped pool of the Breach Candy Club, from which we were, of course, barred. This very pool, in other words, the one excavated in the outline of undivided India, such that Kashmir lies right below your feet as you stand atop the diving platform. The minute I saw the pool, I realized that its designers had missed a trick. It should have been laid out, really, so that the western coast of Pool India was aligned with the western coast of real India, given that the club perched so conveniently on the shore. That way, when the sun doused itself in the Arabian Sea every evening, both Indias would have slipped in clean parallel into night. Instead, Pool India had been rotated a quarter turn counterclockwise, so that a large lawn stretches away to its west near Pakistan, while a smaller lawn and cafe sit roughly in Myanmar. The restaurant and bar are in southern Afghanistan. Sri Lanka is the kiddies pool. <laughs> In vivid contrast to the country, the pool is nearly always thinly populated. One March afternoon, when summer was already breathing down our necks, I had lunch at the club with a friend who had been a member there for two years. During a lull in the conversation, he stared at the pool as if he was seeing it for the first time. People don't swim much here, I've realized, he said. They just sort of potter about more than anything else. At the time, the only person in the water was a bald man shaped like a Roman senator, stroking slow, diligent breaths across the pool. After he emerged, dried himself with a lilac towel and walked away, the pool lay empty for hours. I returned for dinner that same week on a balmy evening and still the pool was uninhabited. It remained that way until 10.45 p.m. when an attendant rang a bell to announce the pool's closure for the day. Nobody needed to pay the clangor any attention. The pool, floodlit and desolate, floated in the darkness like a pale blue amoeba. Mm -hmm. By virtue of its outline, the pool is able to inject a charged symbolism into any consideration at all of the club's affairs. In building the pool during the Daraj, for instance, the British were emphasizing their ownership of India, their iron control over its borders and its topography. After 1947, when India gained its independence, the club insisted it would continue to restrict membership to Europeans only, not quite ready to hand India, the pool, the country, over to its people. In the late 1960s, when protesters picketed the entrance to the club, demanding that Indians be made members as well, they were trying to wrest India, the country, the pool, out of the persisting fog of colonialism. And so to the present, to the events that began in 2012, 
when the erection of a wall next to the kiddies park precipitated a schism within the club. Nominally, at least, the factions were tussling over the club's arch commandment, that while Indians can become ordinary members, only Europeans can become trust members, therefore entitled to serve on the managing committee and steer its business. Once, this rule could safely be said to favor white Europeans and no one else. Today, in theory, its ambit includes Indians with European passports, but white people still fill most of this upper tier of membership. This is a deliciously shocking situation, so fat with political incorrectness that a brawl seemed <laughs> proper and justified. <laughs> but then the matter took on broader contours. There was a legal battle. There were signs of an old elite rattled by and ready to be contemptuous of the brazenness of new money. There were rumbles of fraud and corruption, of a mania of, for land and of politicians flexing their muscles in the shadows, until we appeared to be talking not of the Breach Candy Club, but of India herself, the country once again in perfect congruence with the pool. <laughs> Well, my first, uh, my first four travel books um, were relatively conventional travel books in that I went to places, particularly in South America uh, and also in India. Uh, and that book in India, in the Indian Himalaya, is going to finally be published next month in India, I'm pleased to say, by Hachette India. Uh, but for the last couple of books, I've, in a very lazy way, uh, come home, so to speak, and started writing about England. And that's a familiar trope, the, the travel writer who writes about his own country as if it were a foreign country, and quite a useful way to go. So the last book, which was called The Green Road into the Trees, I walked across southern England uh, in a relatively conventional way. Um, and so for the sequel, uh, the publisher said, well, what are you going to do? Uh, you can do anything you want. And I said, suggested a few things. And they said, well, no, anything you want, as long as it's still in England, and it feels like a follow-up. And I'd always wanted to have, if you like, a South American adventure in England, to travel with a mule. And I traveled with mules a lot in Peru. I loved traveling with mules. They carried everything. They were good company. Uh, and so I suggested for this new book, which is a very simple and large title on the cover, One Man and a Mule, I suggested to the publishers that this could be fun. And of course, they fell on this with alacrity, mainly on the basis that the English will always read anything with an animal in it. They're not, not very interested in people. And that it would, might be a nice play on uh, Stevenson's Travels with a Donkey, the old classic, which I admired as well. And this book has just arrived. It's the first reading I've done from it. It's my own baby, so to speak. It's come just the last couple of days to me. It's not yet on sale until next month. Uh, but I was faced when writing it with an immediate problem, which is whereas in Peru, you can turn up in just about any old village and there will be mules to go, like a taxi, uh, there certainly aren't in England for all sorts of historical reasons, which I go into in the book. Um, whereas you can get mules in India, in China, in South America, in the States, most of Europe, uh, for historical reasons, we don't like mules in this country for all sorts of reasons. So finding one, now that I'd committed to writing the book, proved to be much more difficult than I had anticipated. And so while the book has quite a lot of serious content and was a way to look at what is happening in the countryside, particularly in the north, uh, very far from the metropolitan conversation, and I took the journey shortly before Brexit, so it was a very good way of taking the temperature of a changing country, I'm going to read you a rather lighter bit, which is the opening to the book, and which is part of my quest to find a mule in the first place. You're not what I thought you'd be. Jimmy Richardson gave me a hard look. He was a big man, but had small eyes like currants, set in a broad white face. I had arrived while he was still on the phone. He had plenty of time to assess me as he sat on a sofa surrounded by the spillage from a multi-pack bag of crisps. Nor had he been in any hurry to finish his call. We were in the end house of a terrace street south of Newcastle, close to where they filmed Billy Elliot, an area where shops were shuttered with security blinds and both men and boys wore their hair shaved to the bone. 
Maybe that was the first problem about me. I needed a haircut. But I could tell that Jimmy also liked to weigh up a man and disconcert him a little. Both useful tactics for a horse dealer, or in this case, mule dealer. He had heard I wanted one. I had put word out along the very small network of mule fanciers in England and soon learned there were only a handful of them in each county. This was the first I'd been offered. Jimmy was a few years older than me. He had established this seniority before I arrived when we'd spoken on the phone. So what is it exactly you want to do? As if he already knew but could not quite comp compute it. I'd explained when I ran that I was looking for a mule to take right across England, that I'd worked with mules in Peru and fancied the idea of doing the same in a country in which muleteering had almost died out, and that the north of England, where the tradition of pack animals had lasted longest, was the obvious place to do it, even if, as he quickly surmised, I was a soft southerner. What Jimmy was interested in was my route. I know all the bridleways be here, between here and Appleby and how much I knew about mules. Like I say, you can make a horse, you can ask a donkey, and you can let a mule do whatever it wants. <laughs> we drove over to see his mule, or rather I drove and Jimmy gave directions around the desolate mini roundabouts that led to see him, where, as Jimmy was quick to remind me, Michael Caine had ended up dead on the beach in Get Carter. <laughs> Jimmy told me he'd ridden right across the same route I was gonna take. More impressively, when he'd arrived at one coast from the other, he'd turned straight round and ridden all the way back. But he had done it in the conventional way, on a horse, not a mule, and he'd had a friend to help him, mainly to get down and open gates, as I'm getting a bit heavy to be jumping on and off a saddle. I'm not being funny, said Jimmy, but I need to know what level of horsemanship you have. Particularly if you're on your own, that's two grand's worth of mule you'll be dealing with if I lend or sell you mine. So a marker for the price had been put down. We hadn't yet discussed money. I murmured that I'd worked a lot with mules in Peru, which was true, although to be fair, I'd also worked a lot with muleteers in Peru helping me. The mule was in a field off a roundabout with a couple of horses for company. She was a big, raw-boned, grey brute at over 16 hands, big even if she'd been a horse. Jimmy led her out from the fields on a length of scraggy rope. The mule looked down at me like a haughty Russian model who'd been asked out on a date by a man wearing the wrong sort of trainers. <laughs> you better get on, said Jimmy. I eyed up the mule. I wanted one as a pack animal to carry my gear, not to ride across England. But Jimmy wasn't let going to let that stop him. This was a test of that horsemanship he'd been concerned about. There were no stirrups, let alone a saddle. I felt I could do of a crane to hoist me aboard, and Jimmy had, been un uh, Jimmy had been unclear as to whether anyone had ever ridden this mule before. <laughs> but needs must. He gave me a leg up, complaining I didn't angle my knee in precisely the right way. And then I was riding bareback on this gray mule over a great deal of concrete near a mini roundabout. A, a couple passing in their Skoda looked on askance and gave us a wide berth. <laughs> the mule seemed fine, if surprised by the turn of events. What's her name, I asked Jimmy. Jimmy paused, as if this was a question he had never considered or expected to be asked. I believe, I believe she's called Diamond. It wasn't clear if this was a recollection or a christening. But if Diamond was strong enough to carry 11 stone of human, a charitable estimate, she could carry any pack a considerable distance. The problem would be getting that pack on her, particularly single-handed. The mules I'd worked with in the Andes were around 14 hands, so on the borderline between pony and horse, manageable. Whether I wanted to deal with 16 hands worth of mule clattering around me for weeks was another matter. It would be like going out with a woman who was taller. I can see you're intimidated, said Jimmy. There was a hint in his voice that he was pleased about this. Let me give you a little bit of advice. If the mule doesn't think you're the master from the off, you never will be. Thanks for that, Jimmy. Get down and I'll show you how she leads. That what, that's what you want her for anyway. We led the mule along a desolate bit of edge land that skirted the roundabout. Given there were cars passing, the mule seemed calm and well-behaved 
until one of the horses we'd left gave a whinny and the mule bolted hard enough to leave me, leave me with rope burn. The mule ran onto the centre of the mini roundabout. It was midday and there weren't many cars about, but there were some. Jimmy sent me one way and I, and, sorry, Jimmy sent me one way and he took the other. So we came at the mule in a pincer manoeuvre. We tried this several times without success. A mule running around at speed on concrete or tarmac is a hard thing to stop. She was using the small central island of the roundabout to give her jumps extra spring. A man approaching on the dual carriageway pulled his car up to come and help, which we needed. Someone had to hold the gate to the field open so he could herd the mule back inside. Fuck this for a game of soldiers, said Jimmy. He was sweating. Rounding up a mule that refuses to follow the highway code is hard work. I could tell he was also struggling with a rare emotion. He was embarrassed. I'm really sorry, he said. I'm really sorry. I don't feel I've been much help at all, but at least this happened now, not on a Yorkshire moor 20 miles from Whitby when it was pissing down a rain. But I tell you what, I looked at him impassively. I felt I now had all the cards. I've got a lovely donkey I could loan you. <laughs> I think we're out of time. Have we got time for questions? Or five minutes, if we have. So, quick, any questions before we pack up? At the back, there's one hand straight up here. Yeah, Mike, Mike's, Mike's coming. coming. Firstly, I want to say I really enjoyed this session. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I would like Manisha's full name because that is just... I mean, I'm, I mean it would have been great if Christina Lamb was here, but I think that is brilliant. I'm going to buy her book. Uh, but the question I want to ask is Anthony um, Satin. Um, uh, Land of the Pharaohs, you're looking at culture that is reminiscent of... Have you looked at the remnants of the Opet Festival, the ancient Opet Festival? Because you've got the, the, um, uh, the ceremony uh, to the saint whose name I forget now, that uh, get, what, uh, camel herders and all sorts of people get involved with, from the uh, Karnak to the Luxor uh, to Temple. Which, were, you, were you planted in the audience? Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. No, because I've just come from that. Oh, have you? <laughs> yeah. No, I, it's because I, I haven't been and um, I want to go. There, and, and, there's, yeah. A, there's, yeah, there's a long description. This is a festival that, um, uh, that celebrates uh, the, the, the man who's become the patron saint of Luxor in Egypt, and, and he's buried on top of Luxor Temple. Yeah. Because at that time, Luxor Temple was buried up to the top, up to its capitals in sand. And he was an Iraqi um, holy man who, who had a tariq, a brotherhood, um, there on top of the ancient temple. And one, one of the features of his festival, which happens every year, is that three boats are carried around well, it's around his, his mosque, but it's actually, therefore, around the temple, um, the ancient temple compound. And when they excavated the temple, they discovered images of this exact thing happening in antiquity, three and a half thousand years ago. Uh, yeah, so th there's a long passage oh, right. <laughs> about okay. that in, in the Pharaoh's shadow. Because, right. uh, but I couldn't prove that that same thing had happened continuously for the last... No, you know, last three, no, but, three but it, it years. seems there was a but lot of parallel. But it's a very interesting, yeah. it's a very interesting parallel. Yeah. And the, the mosque actually incorporates some of the capitals of yes. the ancient temple. Yes. So, so this yeah. man is buried sort of literally right next to pharaonic inscriptions. And, and I understand the, um, the, 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 the man dressing up as the queen and the pharaoh, the ceremony is very similar to the, to the ancient uh, Ophir If you festival. look on my yeah. Facebook page, yeah. you'll see uh, film footage from, from last week. Oh, right. OK. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, what is Manisha's surname? Sorry. Manisha Rajesh. Rajesh, OK. And it's around India and 80 trains. Yeah. <laughs> What's that it? Anyone yeah. more? Everyone's going. Any more questions? Uh, behind? There's someone there. Apologies, it's not a question, but I just wanted to say how good that book is around <laughs> India and Asia <laughs> trains. Yeah, great. Anything else? 
Yeah. Question for you, Willie. Um, I read your book on uh, Delhi City of Gins when you went to Karachi. You mentioned that the um, man who used to make Indian sweets for the Mughal emperors had also migrated to Karachi and set up shop there. But you don't give us the address of the uh, lovely shop. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the most famous sweet shop of all um, remains in Delhi. That's Gunti Wallers in, uh, in Chandi Chowk. And uh, when I wrote City of Gins, it was still there. And uh, it, famously, the, there was the Royal Elephants. There was a bell outside that the Royal Elephants would ring when they wanted sweets when they, when they passed. And uh, every procession apparently would stop because the elephants knew where the sweet shop was. And they'd just use their trunk and ring the bell. And they'd be given ladus. And then they'd go on. Uh, uh, but sadly, Gunty Wallace closed down finally after 200 uh, years, uh, 250 years, five years ago. Um, but there's a, a younger brother migrated to Karachi, so there's still a branch in Burns Road. Um, uh, but I can't give you the exact address off the top of my head. Uh, but it's called Gunty Wallace, so uh, ask around in Burns Road in Karachi. Anything else? What? Last oh. chance? Okay, please, a big round of applause. This is wonderful time, right? Thank you. Oh, a big round of applause for Ariel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody on the panel. It was indeed a mesmerizing session.